Dr. Dalja, I want to talk about the mystery of the moment. It's a mystery for Mayor Adams of New York. It is a mystery for the President of the United States. And it's a mystery for the woman that lives three doors down from Lisa Abramowitz trying to figure out what to do next on COVID. What is the timeline forward of this variant? What does the research show of what to expect one week out and three weeks out on the glide paths of cases hospitalizations, and deaths. What we've seen from other countries, and we have to see if this is extrapolable to the U.S., is that the Omicron variant takes a very quick a, a very quick tour through a country. It's not something that lasts for months the way Delta does, that it comes in week intervals rather than in months. So two to three weeks seems to be what it takes for it to peak and then to rapidly decline. Maybe because, not, not because it's infecting everyone, but because it's infecting those people who are most susceptible to get infected, those people that are out there and then everybody else starts to change their behavior and then it collapses. That's what people are predicting will happen. Maybe by maybe the next couple of, of days to weeks, we, we should be able to see if that pattern holds. But it is going to cause a lot of disruption in its wake because many people get infected and we have to worry about hospitalizations, even if they're lower with Omicron being at least of a magnitude big enough for some hospitals that are already kind of at capacity to get pushed over the edge. Speak of our understanding of its virulence. If I do the easy math of 300,000 dead at a given rate, or I look at a normal flu of 40 or 50,000 a year dead, speak of the relative virulence of Omicron. So it's probably about half of what Delta was in terms of its ability to hospitalize and kill based on what we're seeing from uh, other countries. But it still is likely a little bit higher than influenza. And you have to also take into account the, the transmissibility. Because Omicron is much more transmissible, even if it has a lower case fatality ratio, if it infects more people quickly, that could still end up being a, a wash in the end that the same amount of people get infected because the attack rate is so much higher. But what we do know is that, yes, people tend to be hospitalized less, less oxygen, less ICU use, and, and I think that's good, but it still may be too much for the system to handle. Dr. Adalja, how long are people contagious? Most people are contagious for maybe about five, five or so days. That's the average or the median contagiousness of time period. So there are some people that are contagious for, le contagious for less, maybe two or three days, and some people more, maybe 10 days. And that's what we were trying to do with changing the, the guidelines for isolation and quarantine realizing that a one-size-fits-all way of thinking about this doesn't actually work. And you could precision guide it by using antigen tests to see when someone goes negative. But the contagiousness is clustered in the very first uh, part of infection. We knew that from case control studies, looking at contact, contact uh, tracing, seeing when people got infected, and it was always clustered in the first half of illness. Dr. Dalja, let's say we are moving into an endemic phase of the pandemic, which you said probably happened a while back. What should the guide be for workplaces in order to get people back into the office and back into rotation? Which aspect, which test, which quarantine period should they really be looking at? For organizations, I think that they could use antigen tests because they're trying to make sure there's not transmission in their workplace. So that means trying to exclude people who are contagious. So I think they could do daily antigen testing for people. And when people get infected, stick with maybe a five-day default isolation period and then have rapid tests to kind of precision guide when that can come off. And then you can use masks as you need to in that situation. But if you're using a lot of rapid tests, if you've got a fully vaccinated workforce, I think you're in a good position. But what's happening is many organizations have zero tolerance for cases. And if you have zero tolerance for cases of COVID-19, there's no path into opening your office because there's always going to be cases there. So you've got to find a way to come up with a sustainable approach that you're not getting out outbreaks in your office, but that you know that there's going to be cases and you can't shut down, go to virtual every time, just like schools and universities have to do the very same thing. Doctor, they don't just have zero tolerance for cases. They also have requirements for a PCR test, not just a rapid test. Can you explain to us the usefulness of that? After someone has been isolating for five days, they've had a positive case. Is a PCR test useful in the weeks afterwards? 
Absolutely not. It's actually the wrong test to be using. They should be using antigen tests because PCR positivity can go on for maybe 12 weeks and it doesn't correlate with anybody's contagiousness because there may be viral debris that's taking some time to clear in someone who's fully recovered, not contagious, and the PCR is going to continue testing positive. So that's an incorrect way to do it and it's going to artificially disrupt your office workplace much more than if you actually use antigen tests or use time-based, saying maybe 10 days or just 10 days without any tests. That would also be better than using PCR tests. PCR tests should not be used for a screening of asymptomatic individuals. That's not what they were designed for. It's the wrong test that's giving you the wrong answer.